All right, so I want to talk about Eddie George by way of Trey Sermon because Trey Sermon did what I told you he was going to do at Columbus, which is set the world on fire. But even Ryan Day came out and said after the game, we didn't know that he had that in him until that game because we didn't know Trey. Like, he's coming off an injury. We hadn't been able to see him because of quarantine and COVID. So he gets here, and we're not really sure. And at times, he did not look like the kind of guy that should be spelling Master Teague, let alone the feature back at Oklahoma like he once was. And he's coming off of a really bad leg injury. But against Northwestern, when Justin Fields plays the worst game of his career, Trey Sermon puts the Buckeyes on his back. 29 carries, 331 yards, only 60 yards rushing in the first half to break Eddie George's school record for rushing yards in one game. And I believe that year that Eddie George set that record, he won the Heisman in 95. I don't think Eddie George is that good. Maybe he was that good at Ohio State. I wasn't watching Ohio State football in 95. Okay. Oh yeah, like you can look at the numbers. He he was he was amazing at Ohio State. Right. But in the NFL, 3.4 yards per carry. I had to watch all those Titan teams that he played on. And I'm going, why does Eddie keep getting the ball? Well, you gotta remember he was great at Ohio State. This is the NFL, is what I would be yelling. I'd be yelling, this is the NFL over and over again. So that's that's where my Eddie George shade comes from. Because I have no knowledge of this man in Scarlet and Gray. By the way. Because everything comes back to Tulsa. The athletic director and then head coach at Tulsa football was John Cooper. Head coach at Ohio State from 88 to, I believe, 2000 was John Cooper. So John Cooper actually brought in Orlando Pace and Eddie George, among others, and got run off of Ohio State. For this dude from Youngstown State that ended up being pretty doggone good. But you get my point here. Everything comes back to Tulsa football. I'm doing this intense research on Jimmy Johnson and the Dallas Cowboys. And one of the other things that I managed to see was uh, Jerry Rome of TU fame, coach quarterbacks at Dallas, but also on that staff early was Butch Davis, who coached not just Miami, but has Super Bowl rings. But Butch Davis had never been a head coach except one time in his entire career until he became the head coach of the University of Miami. Tulsa Rogers High School, where... That squad went three and six. Man who took over at Miami after Butch Davis stupidly went to play or went to uh, head coach the Cleveland Browns, Larry Coker, who got started in Fairfax, Oklahoma, who coached Claremore, the Zebras, into being something like a juggernaut, probably, you know, was the first wave of Canards because the Canards have been playing football like the Lockets have been playing football forever. And then was a running backs coach and offensive coordinator for John Cooper at Tulsa before going over there, making a stop, I think, at Arkansas on the way to Miami. So everything comes back to Tulsa. And I can pretty much guarantee that. Or I can play six degrees of uh, Kevin Bacon with it. Uh, wow, there's an Oklahoma State fan in this channel with a $5 super chat. He says, Pokes, pistols firing. RJ, love how you keep it real. New to your channel this year. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. All right, then. So, Ron, you watched some Eddie George clips. What I miss? Oh man, this is one of those situations where. So, uh, what er, earlier this uh, this weekend we or start of the week we talked about uh, the the Orange Bowl, ninety one Orange Bowl, Miami versus Texas, and we start we we looked at the quarterbacks then and like oh this is like a, a a truly monstrous team out here like this is just full of full of talent all the way around. And we looked at the quarterbacks and they they complete fifty four percent of their passes. And this was good. This is this is all American worthy. <laughs> they talk about Eddie Bernie George. Kosar slinging it, and I'm like, wait, he did what? <laughs> I'm sorry, that was 2,800 yards. You say lighting them up. Anyway, so whenever we, we like we talk about, it, like it was just a different time. Like I'm looking at Eddie George's stats, and you know, I was ready to, I was ready to show up and just absolutely ride for him. But it's kind of one of those. That's just what it was back in the day. Only thing that I could get, I could tell you is that he kind of offset the three yards per carry by catching the ball a lot. I I can't shrug hard enough. Like let me let me. He averaged eleven hundred yards over nine years. Like he's he's good. He's good. I, I you you don't you don't like him, but you could probably say that he's a serviceable NFL running back. 
Let's. Uh, let, cool. well, I, I think that he was really good. I think Andrew Johnson just jumped in here with a five dollars super chat to help your case. He said Eddie George was a four time Pro Bowler and one time first team All Pro with over ten thousand yards rushing in the NFL. How you hate on that? Because I watched those teams. How many Super Bowls did they win? And by the way, you know what it takes to make the Pro Bowl? The Pro Bowl. The Pro Bowl. The dudes ahead of you just need to be playing in the playoffs. That's it. When I look at the number of dudes that make the Pro Bowl, I think it is the most overrated All Star event ever and it is because it's one of the most widely watched television shows every year but don't tell me somebody is a pro bowler to bolster your argument all pro that's a great one it's really difficult to be all pro, all pro. that is the elite right that's first team all american don't tell me about some honorable mention i don't care you know like to rod taylor made the pro bowl at buffalo how many of y'all know that you know i look around at some of the dudes that make pro bowl i'm like what but I do think that, Ron, that's a good point in that 10,000 yards, that just means they gave you the ball a bunch. Because you know who would have had 10,000 yards if he just kept playing? Steven Jackson. I would take Steven Jackson over Eddie George in a heartbeat. Every single, and here's where I was going with this. Who has the better NFL career now that we have these stats in front of us? Trey Sermon, who might vault into the third round, right? Or Eddie George, because I think Trey Sermon has some Josh Jacobs in him. Like, are, are we saying that who's who's going to have a better pro career? Yeah. I, it, it's got to be Eddie George. Because okay. I don't, you can't be, you know, like I say, you can't be a prime time. Eddie George is touching the ball 400 times a year for a majority of, of his of his career. Running backs just don't get the chance to do that nowadays. So, they're, they're he showed up. They're, okay. I'm not saying that all of them, but okay. like there were more running backs like Eddie George in, say, 1998, then 2020. I feel like you and I do this all the time, but one of the things I look at is, like, 70s NFL players or, you know, early 80s NFL players. I'm like, you know, we could play, right? And it's like, yeah, because we were raised here and not then. So I'm looking at some of these backs in the 90s, in the 80s, and going, which one of these dudes would I like more? Over, not Derrick Henry, right? But your, like I said, Steven Jackson. Like your Dalvin Cook, Alvin Kamara, right? Dudes that are good, if not borderline elite. And mm-hmm. I keep playing that game until I get to like James White, right? Until I get to like, oh, Todd Gurley. Like it was oh, the listen, Rams. You're- you're trying to think about like you're 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 trying to bench race like your your middle class of running backs, right? right? Versus, Not necessarily your versus the upper the echelon of, all times. of 80s mm-hmm. and 90s running backs. So like Roger Craig and whatnot. Nice. I mean, think about it. Think about it. Uh, man, look at us talking about 90s football. Did you play Tech Mobile? I feel like I played it for a little bit. Oh yeah, I played I played okay. Tech Mobile for like five years. So why do why do the old folks keep telling me that Bo Jackson was colder than Christian Okoye on that game? Because he was. Oh it's man, a matter of degrees on that. All you do is you hit the spin like, button with Okoye and, and you go to the house. Bo, Bo Jackson, Bo Jackson just kept on going. Uh, Bo Jackson was. Well, Bo Jackson, video Bo Jackson. Hmm. He tr- he's the he's the best or second best hmm. video game athlete. Christian Okoye was just real good. Um, just a, he's just a real fun play. My, my, Mike Vick on 04 Madden. Yeah, that's number one. Yeah, man. All right, so let's get to a headline topic. Dabo Sweeney's coaches poll or uh, ballot. Okay, so the one thing that I absolutely love as a like in the weeds college football fan is looking at the coaches poll ballots to end the season because you know that somebody is – in their bag, but also, like, there's a number of coaches that are in their bag that rank their team way too high. But there are also coaches that rank other teams way too low because they can't stand them. So I'm going to preface this by saying Dabo Sweeney ranked Ohio State, his opponent in the Sugar Bowl, who's rated number three, according to the selection playoff committee and the Associated Press. So consensus number three. He rated them number 11. Just behind number 10, Coastal Carolina. So Dabo Sweeney is really taking it hard that Ohio State got to play just six games and gets into the playoff. 
To which, you know, one, it, I, I got to ask a question. How would Dabo Sweeney feel about his Clemson Tigers if they only got to play six games because that's what the ACC said they had to do and then made the playoff? I mean, Dabo Sweeney thinks, thinks himself to be untouchable. If he, if he got to play six games, and let's say that he got to play uh, the sorriest teams on his schedule for those six games, he absolutely would be saying, like, look at this. We've been we're destroying people 70, 73 to 7. Look at us. We need to be in the playoffs. And uh, it, it's like, let's say that uh, Ohio State got to use up all their games and maybe dropped one to whoever, uh, Wisconsin, I don't care. Uh, he would say, like, yeah, we absolutely deserve a chance to be in there. Uh, and he would rate Ohio State at 11 and him <laughs> in the top four. Man. That's what he would do. So I'm, I wrote a story about this, and it'll be up on FoxSports.com at some point. But I, I did some early previews of the playoff pairings, right? So in writing about... Clemson, Ohio State, I have to build the bad blood here because it's there. And y'all know the one thing I love more than anything else about college football is talking noise and talking trash. And anything that involves the Woody Hayes story, I'm probably going to tell you. And this, like the genesis of Clemson, Ohio State, has Woody Hayes right at the center. But before we get to that, you should know Ohio State has never beaten Clemson. And remember, Ohio State lives to beat up everybody. Everybody. And they get their persona from Woody Hayes because Ohio State was not really thought about, not really, until after World War II. It's really Michigan in that conference. Okay, Woody Hayes comes along, gives them an identity that is, we take nothing off of nobody. I'm hitting anybody all the time for anything they do. And we hate that team up north. Okay. So they get the Gator Bowl in 1978. One of the last, it was the last year that Woody Hayes coached Ohio State because in that game, as they were losing, Art Schlichter threw an interception. It was picked off by the nose guard. Shout out for the, for the big man interception, Charlie Bauman. Charlie Bauman gets tackled by Schlichter on the sideline. Woody Hayes grabs Clemson nose guard Charlie Bauman and throat punches him. Okay? This is the end of a number of incidents that involve Woody Hayes. Clemson won that game 17-15, to completed their first 10-win season in school history, and every time that Ohio State and Clemson have matched up since then, Clemson has won, dating back to the BCS and into this playoff period. And now we got a rematch of Justin Fields versus Trevor Lawrence in an Ohio State team that is not as strong as the one that we saw last year, needed to pull out some games late against Northwestern. I mean, they went into the into halftime, down 10-6 to Northwest in the Big Ten Championship game. Needed to pull out a, a late touchdown against Indiana. Just is not as strong as we would have liked them to be. That said, Dabo is out here making sure that Ohio State players are just gassed up for this game. Because I can't imagine being the head coach at Clemson and saying, why are we going to let a team that plays six games, get in the playoff, and then say, it's like you know, doing 60 hours toward a business degree and then getting the four-year degree that usually takes everybody else 120 hours. And then going on to be like on ESPN, we have tremendous respect for Ohio State and ranking them 11th in your coach's poll. Like, what, what, what does he expect to, be, to do for his players in this way? Like, if you're a player, do you go up to coach and say, hey, hey coach, cal calm down, please? Like, they're mad enough. <laughs> or, or is this what you live for? 